most of my notes. <laughs> <laughs> so without further ado, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, many thanks. It's a real pleasure to be here and to have heard Paul just talking about uh, this 10th anniversary. And that lovely thing about from pathology to possibility. Um, and also the emphasis on love and trust. Um, I'm, I suppose I'm really curious in relation to what I do because I've spent the last 30 odd years um, trying to bring into the academy the embodied knowledge of people like yourself. So practitioners who have actually spent quite a lot of time reflecting on what we do, becoming aware of the values they hold. But in relation to the traditional kind of academic knowledge, don't find that those kind of values to do with love, trust, justice, compassion, care, are living, what I call living standards of judgment. So when you talk about standards, what I'm curious about, and as I said, I've spent the last 30 years trying to do this, is to bring into the universities these standards of judgment which are actually values based. So for example, uh, and just before I show you my use of technology, which is rather different uh, to Paul's use, where I don't want to use it uh, literally as an information sheet, so you can see how we just had 40 minutes, really interesting information. What I want to do is to try to convince you that this is a forum now. It's like a window which can bring into this room narratives from all over the world of people who have been coaching other people but in relation to fundamental human values. And those stories, I can show you how you can access them. But it's like using this as, a, as I say, a window which can bring into the room those narratives. And I just want to check with you whether you've actually managed to bring your narrative and actually share that through this medium. Because over the next 10 years of the association, I want to suggest that this will become increasingly important if we're to move from pathology to possibility with your narratives of your influence in your practice, trying to live your values as fully as possible, but bringing what we call evidence-based accounts into the public arena and sharing those largely through the web and with standards and that kind of sense of assessment which is values-based. But before I go on, can I, I just get a sense of how many of you, um, how many of you take love? How many of you have accounted for what you do and your influence using love as a standard of judgment and that you've been willing to put on the web? <coughs> can, I, can I just check how many of you? What's a standard of judgment? It, it's accountability. So I, for example, in the here and now, I'm actually delighted to have been invited here because by being with you, just as you came into the room, and last night there was an informal gathering, and the people that I was with, that you evoked in me a flow of energy, which I associate with what I call a loving warmth of humanity. Now, I'm willing to account for what I do in relation to enhancing the flow of that love and affection that Paul talked about, in relation to the narratives that I put on the web. Is that okay? Because this is really important. Yeah, it's really vital. And I'll try and show you where you can access. Uh, I've got over 32 of the uh, doctors I've supervised the last 16 years to completion, each one of whom has tried to answer that question in their own unique way about the values that they use as the standards to which they are accountable. So, can I just check how many of you have already produced those kinds of narratives and actually shared them with others? So, if you're thinking about your influence, so we've got one person, we've got two, three, Okay, four, five. Okay, so in, in the room at the moment, we've got five people who have actually, in relation to their coaching practice, made public the accounts of their influence. Now, what I want to suggest over the next 10 years of the association is that that will become much more common as we move with that acceptance of neuroscience and neuroplasticity, where we recognize that things are not just given, we can actually shift the ways in which we think through the structures of our mind. And I'll just give you one or two examples. I'll show you what I've done in relation to the keynotes that I give, so you can access these with these resources. That, as I say, this isn't just a sheet of information. What this is doing is bringing narratives into this room for you freely to access. Now, if you go into the key things, actionresearch.net, if you just remember that URL, actionresearch.net, it gives you access to all of these resources. 
And, and what I, I do with my keynotes, for example, in this What's New section, there are a couple of symposia that are coming in September at the British Education Research Association, first two. Uh, my notes for, for this session, as I say, it's not for you to read at the moment, but it's just, that is where you can actually access them, uh, if you want to. You, you can just go into the actionresearch.net, down to the What's New section, and you can actually access these notes for this session. So the preparation that I've done is for you, if you wish, to go and just um, examine some of the ideas and respond because my email's there, there's an e-forum that you can participate in. But, so that's the preparation that I've done, that I always put my notes on the web for people to access at their leisure. Okay, so that's what this is to do, is to bring these narratives to you that you can then respond with your own and actually uh, share them. But I'm just curious how many of you, because the title of this was Improving the Coaching with the Action Research, um, I imagine many people here are familiar with the action research cycles. Um, may, I, may I just check that? That if I, if I put an action reflect like this one, where what you do is you, you say, right, I've got a concern, some of my values are not being lived fully. Okay, this creates a tension. And what happens? Your imaginations start to work. You imagine possibilities. You choose one to act on. You act on it and then evaluate, and as you're acting, you sometimes gather data to make a judgment. But then you evaluate what you're doing in relation to your values, and then you modify in relation to those evaluations using that action reflection cycle, which is common, it goes back to Lewin. Actually, Dewey uh, had that sense of a logic of inquiry following that kind of cycle. Now, I imagine that that is familiar to everybody here, and the nods that I'm getting. Right? So that is something I think we probably share, that when we're working on something we want to improve, we all recognize that this is a, a desirable kind of inquiry. What you may not be as familiar with is this idea that everybody in this room, as well as the people you work with, have the capacity to produce valid explanations of their own influences and your own influences in your own learning and the learning of others, as well as in the social formation in which we live and work. Those three elements seem to me to be really vital in relation to accounting for what we do and why. Now, this was 40 years ago. I was studying at London University uh, educational theory with two of the country's uh, most important philosophers of education. But at the time, we've got Richard Peterson and Paul Hess. They had a group of philosophers around at the Institute. And they claimed that educational theory was made up of philosophy, psychology, sociology, and history of education. That was educational theory. At the time, I was teaching full time in the East End of London in Tower Hamlets. And for the first three years, of going through this, I, I was following what they said. That educational theory was made up of those academic disciplines, and it was up to the philosophers, psychologists, sociologists, historians to tell me what these theories were, to that constitute educational theory. Now, it took me some years to recognize that in doing that, they were replacing and explicitly removing my eye with my questions, how do I improve my practice in the classroom with the children, from educational theory. Now, it did take quite a long time for me to recognize the power of the sociocultural and that historical influence in a way which I thought, as I understood it, colonizing. They were colonizing my mind so that I could not put forward my educational theory, which was emerging from my practice with the children, and explain my influence, I with this, in my learning, not as an egotistic lie, but as a relationally dynamic eye in the sense of the booba IU relationship. Now, it was that that moved me to the University of Bath in 1973 from being a science teacher and a head of science because I think that the academics have got educational theory wrong. They, they made that fundamental mistake to take out of educational theory the kind of explanations that everybody in this room, I think, are capable of producing. Not only that, if I say, look, I think that I love what I do, I believe, I hope, uh, like last night, there was a lot of humor, that there was an energy in the room which I refer to as a life-affirming energy. In just going into the informal setup, it was lovely, the, there was a, a delight in the room, pleasure in people meeting each other, and there was, a, a, as I say, life-affirming energy, which I associate with what Paul was talking about, the love, the trust, and the hope. That is where I'm suggesting that everybody here could bring in those kinds of energy-flowing values 
as explanatory principles about your influence in the world with the people you're working with. If we could spread the influence of the values that are in this room, spread them more widely, the world becomes a better place to be. That is the assumption on which the work that I've been doing rests. And so that's why I emphasize the importance of all of us generating what I've been calling your living fears. These are your explanations of your influence and my explanation of my influence, not only in my own learning, but in the learning of others. I've got a whole range of accredited programs, because I normally work on accredited masters and doctoral programs, but also the non-accredited work is actually the base, the, the grounding is the non-accredited, the informal work that I do, which then leads up to these publicly validated accounts. Are you okay with that just at the moment? Because yeah. there are certain things that many of us have been almost colonized in relation to our minds. So I'll just give you a few examples. If I ask you to focus on your inquiry, how do I improve what I'm doing? Now I imagine all of you are really passionate about improving what it is that you're doing and the influence you're having. If you try uh, to put I, in your question, um, in an academic context, up to, what, 10, 15 years ago, you would be told to remove your eye from the discourse. Yeah. Yeah. Still recognize that? Yeah. This was still happening in one of the universities in the Northeast last year. A practitioner put forward their research, uh, how do I improve what I'm doing? Research committee send back, you've got to take the personal pronoun out of your question. Now, this feels to me to be so silly. Do you, how can you take the eye out of your inquiry and it still makes sense? So we've still got a problem. And don't hesitate if you feel that you want to actually make a point in these sessions because over 40 minutes, it feels to me really important that you also uh, respond, if you wish, to make any points that you want to make. So don't, don't hesitate, please, because I'm believing that if you acknowledge your eye in what I call as a living contradiction that you will actually be able to transform how the academies are generating knowledge and that's globally because I've been quite a bit of work with China and Japan and also with Canada and South Africa and the, the same issue arises that the eye is actually seen to be subjective how can you produce a story it's just anecdote surely it can't stand up to rigorous and valid tests now actually I think everybody here can submit their accounts of what they're doing with evidence base to others and develop a very rigorous process of validation. But your eye has got to come into the inquiry. And more, yes? Well, I was just going to say, it, 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 one of the problems, I believe, is that um, some people can't do that. They can't self-reflect. They can't, they can't ask themselves, how, do, uh, how am I doing? and see, the self can't see the self. Mm -hmm. Now, it, and almost in the university, I think in defense of that, they have turned it into a, an inappropriate uh, yeah. method of inquiry. No, I completely agree. So the self cannot see the self, yeah? yeah. Now, until 1971, <laughs> I couldn't see myself. Yeah, but I believed in my science classrooms, I've got inquiry and learning going. Genuinely believed that I was responding to the children's questions. The inspectors gave me one of three cameras in the London area to experiment with to see its potential. And it's like this today. I turned the camera on myself, I looked at my lesson, and I had one of the biggest shocks of my life. <laughs> uh, first of all, the embarrassment was enormous because I could see that I hadn't not only got um, an inquiry and learning, I just hadn't got it going with the children. Literally, every question, no matter how subtly, I was providing for the children. You know, I'd already got the resources planned, and what I couldn't see until I saw myself on the video was the fact that this is what I was doing. Now, immediately I could see it, I could feel it was a real embarrassment, there was a lot of tension, some shame there, but the imagination immediately started working. I could feel I'm a living contradiction, but I don't want to be, I want to live my values, so that self, reflecting on self, that piece of technology has been one of the greatest aids to me and with others, be able to see themselves as others see us. So I think that's where I stress the importance of the video because um, often on your own, so you don't do it initially with other people, you have full control over seeing yourself, but it is a real aid to helping you to see yourself as others see you. So 
that is something that I would also, when you see all the accounts, they're all multimedia accounts. I was very active in the University of Bath because I've spent my working life there. In 2004, I was on a special Senate committee uh, to make recommendations about the way in which degrees, uh, research degrees, were submitted. And after years of battling, trying to get the eye and trying to get multimedia yet accepted, suddenly there was absolutely no problem. In 2004, the university changed its regulations to permit multimedia narratives, including DVDs, visual data, to be accepted for research degrees. So that's something that I think some universities still don't permit, mm -hmm. um, those forms of representation. Yet for coaches, whose work, in that sense of being bad embodied values, that you're trying to actually improve in practice, I do think this, this visual narratives are really vital to communicate the nature of the influence that we're having. Now, can I, can I ask, is that okay? Because you've got the eye as a living contradiction, the use of the video to try to get appropriate uh, representations of what we're doing, so that the self can actually see the self and put forward accounts of how we're living our values. And in relation to values, this is why it's so important, is that if you just get printed text and I put all of these analyses with referencing in that account, you know, in that, um, the paper that is here, um, in terms of the title, you know, Improving Coaching Through Action Research with Living Theories, <coughs> you'll have given all the references in terms of the multimedia, I as living contradiction, and perhaps the most important, which is what I think we're very interested in, which is how do you use um, the values, for example, I hope you sense, that even now, as I'm with you now, it's actually being with you that is evoking a certain amount of energy. Now, it's like Paul said, I don't know if you can feel this, but I'm actually feeling energized just by being with you. Now, it's very difficult not to dominate, isn't it, from this position. I, I genuinely want to stimulate your accounts to come forward and come into not only this room, but into the global community through there. Yeah. You've reminded me of something sweet that has happened to me on a few occasions. I supervise coaches, and one of them said to me at least three times, I feel taller when I leave your room. I love that, because yeah. I do as well. <laughs> now, it is, it is that feeling which I'm suggesting, and I know it's difficult, this, but if you could build a visual narrative, which show the pleasure and the trust, and I would suggest the love as well, because often we love what we do. Um, and in, I think it was only six, my, one of my first doctoral students, a mature woman, uh, Eleanor Law, hers was the first doctorate uh, with love in the title. It was called Love at Work. Okay, and the external examiners with the videos understood her meaning of this energy and the love that she was feeling for what she was doing. And she established love as a standard of judgment. Marian Naidu, wonderful, she advised the Labour government in relation to mental health. Marian does a lot of work on theatre for development. You get into my living theory section, I'll show you where you can access these. Marian's was a passion for compassion, passion for compassion. And it was videos of um, Alzheimer's patients, um, and one of them in particular, and her carer. And her carer was a husband of some 40 odd years, called George. And it was George and Marian. Marion was also the researcher, and the examiners were <coughs> convinced that they understood Marion's notion of a passion for compassion with a video that is actually accessible from my website. As you see, Marion, who is actually looking quite comatose on a settee, suddenly coming alive and relating to her husband in a way that demonstrated she was actually following some of the conversations George talked about what he was doing as a carer. And the examiners at that moment understood, with the help of the visual, what Marion's passion for compassion actually was as an academic standard of judgment. I, I, again, okay, don't hesitate to come forward if you want to actually ask any questions here, because I'll just go and show you. If you, for example, want to access any of these narratives, so that, that is where you can get into my account here. I'll just show you uh, how these things work, because there's my account. Normally you wouldn't go down to the references, but with this, if you go down to the reference and you actually um, access these URLs, um, you can see that <coughs> some of them, um, this one here, because it's enlarged so you can see it by Robin Pound, is her coaching that she's offered um, 
to young mothers with their babies, and often the babies with the sleep patterns, the mothers have a lot of difficulty sometimes working out appropriate ways of getting the babies to sleep. So Robin, as a health visitor and coach, has worked with the mothers with their young babies to help with that. Now from that reference section you can immediately access Robin's home page and you can actually go into uh, some of the uh, videos, for example, which show this process in action with mother, baby and... Uh, Ruth describes how she put our previous conversation into practice while George learns to sleep by himself. She remains responsive to George while showing him what she expected. This alongside health visiting approach recognises Ruth's parenting style and the skills and emotional needs of both George and Ruth. So alongside this is about connected relationships. It's about equality and mutual respect in which beliefs, hopes and parenting style are important. All views are valuable, but responsibility for decisions rests with just mention that because there's about 15 minutes, it interjects with both the visuals with George and mother ba a baby. What Robin learned to do over the past month, from being completely technologically illiterate six months ago, she's actually done this all herself. She's got the video clips of that relationship, she's put voiceovers, she's put transitions in with these uh, text pieces, and got a, a multimedia account which justifies some of the work that she's doing. Now, I think everybody here, because of iMovie, uh, you know, the ease now of the editing, I think everybody here will be really competent to do this very, very quickly. But that is accessible for you from that other, uh, the referencing section of those URLs. But one of the nice things I, I like very much about um, the, where, can you see that cursor just at the bottom? Where you can move the cursor along to any point, and you can actually stop. And this is where the visual is very important with that cursor. And literally within a minute, a thousandth of a second, a hundredth of a second, you can pick up the embodied expression of meaning and value, which becomes unmistakable when you're talking about with mother, child, and baby, love, the trust, uh, inspiration in, la in language that academics have not been used to using, and yet is part of our lives. I, I, what I want to check is if you're okay about how to access this. Yes. Yeah, you're okay with that? Yes. Good. Now, could I just pause them and just ask, is there, is there anything else that you feel, okay, you just want to ask about these processes before I go on and just show you some of the other uh, resources that you can actually access? Yeah? Do you find that your PhD students need to be tutored into this way of working, or do they come naturally to you because they're drawn to your way? Okay. Let me take one or two and I'll come down. Yeah. Yes? I just wanted to see the denouement. I actually wanted to see Faith go to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but if you look at yeah, that 15 minute, you, you'll see the negotiation that's going on. With, again, love and trust. You, yeah. Any other? Yeah. Just a comment to say, I love the value of alongsidedness. Yeah. That was Robin's original contribution to knowledge through a doctorate. Not many health visitors have got their doctorates through studying their own practice. Her original contribution was exactly that. It was a meaning of alongsideness. It had a lot of qualities that, and I put this in my paper, of Martin Buber's. Martin Buber, many of you may know, he was a Jewish theologian. He had a lovely poetic work called I Am Thou. And he had a notion of the I-You relationship. And Robin's alongsideness relation with others has that quality. So again, for you to say, I like, you know, the alongsidedness. That for Robin, as I said, was her original contribution. And everybody here will have their own. Anything else before? Yeah? This is just a question. You were the negotiation between Yeah. But that, that kind of presumes a sort of equality or something. Yeah. And in fact, it is. And I think the word is regulation. Because what, the, what the mother is trying to do is, as it were, is catch the child's process, take it back into herself and then pass it back in a reformed way. Yeah. That, that, again, that's absolutely... Can I come... Again, if you let me come back to that, okay, so that, that nature of the relationship is very important because the alongsideness relationship, it, it actually transforms what I normally did uh, in terms of my uh, supervision, where I was definitely 
uh, having the responsibility for the student. As I began to tutor and supervise practitioner researchers, like everybody in this room, I had to recognize that, for example, everybody here will have more knowledge of coaching than I have. You will have superior knowledge to me in some areas of the life you're living. And therefore, with the work that I did for the last uh, certainly 16 years, there was this particular equality in the relationship and recognizing that we might each have different kinds of knowledge, um, but it wasn't of a hierarchical kind, and the alongsideness was part of the quality of relationship that I think has been why I was the most successful um, supervisor of doctoral thesis uh, in the Department of Education over the last 16 years. It's not a lot, but it was uh, two a year, so that was 32 over the last 16 years, which was more than you know, my colleagues, and there was no dropouts. That this was part-time students, and you know how difficult that is, but I, I think it was that I got from Robin and others these qualities that allowed me to show how much I valued uh, their embodied knowledge. And it links to what you're saying, because um, everybody that I, I work with, I actually recognize that superior knowledge. Now, I do coach, okay? so I'll give you one example. That I say to everybody, look, you've already got the embodied knowledge, and everybody I work with, they have master educators, if not doctor educators. But what they don't have experience of is bringing their stories into a, a university throughout the world and seeing that it can be accredited yet for masters and doctoral degrees. So what I do is I coach, in relation to some of you may know, the work of the social theorist called Jürgen Habermas. And what I've done in my paper on the web is to explain how I coach people in terms of the use are four criteria that Jürgen Habermas says are at the heart of the evolution of society. So he's got a view of communication and the evolution of society that is actually grounded in these four principles. Right? And I think you'll recognize them. He says, look, in now making sense of what I'm saying, he believes that you're really focusing on, is this guy being comprehensible? In other words, a very basic one. Am I making sense? The other one is, I'm making various claims. Do I have sufficient evidence to back up the claims that I'm making, to justify them? Which any positive scientist, as I was when I got my first degree in physics and chemistry, you know, but it, it, it was concerned with evidence. Do I have sufficient evidence? The third one, which I didn't have to bother about as a physical scientist, was do I show my awareness of what is known as the normative background for which I'm writing? Now, all of the people that I've worked with are encouraged to demonstrate that there is a, a very profound understanding that is needed about the cultural influences, the socio-cultural, the socio-historical influences that are actually working all the time in terms of who we are and what we're doing. My, my biggest shock was uh, in tutoring uh, Islamic students who self-identified as Islam. I had a particular view that I got early on in the 1970s called democratic evaluation. So I used, in all of my action research, a process of democratic evaluation, which I had to take for granted. I got it from Dewey, you know, I'm really passionate for democracy. It took me a long time to recognize that my view of democracy, when I looked about educational theory from an Islamic perspective, from theoreticians in Saudi Arabia, that they were very clear that my view of democracy, coming from a Western perspective, and their language is inimical to educational theory from an Islamic perspective. Now, I demonstrated then to my Islamic students that I recognized there were tensions and difficulties here, that again, I needed to demonstrate that sensitivity and awareness, that there wasn't just one view of democracy. And in some cultures, my view was simply not accepted. So that was the third one, that normative factor. The fourth one, I think everybody here will recognize, and Habermas said, look, you've got to demonstrate over time and interaction that you truly believe in the values that you claim to hold. And he took this the sense of authenticity. He said that the fourth criteria for the communication, the evolution of society, is that you are really authentic in relation to the accounts that you're bringing. But you can't judge my authenticity here just from being with you. You might feel I'm authentic or that I'm showing that energy and the love I talk about. But it's only over interaction through time 
And looking at the last, say, 30 years, where I've had to be working in this way, that I think there is then sufficient evidence for you to say, yes, these accounts are related <coughs> because the meanings are being clarified over the course of years in interaction with others. Now, that was a really vital question. You know, that people do not come with those kind of skills to be able to make their knowledge public in a way which is rigorous and valid. And that, that is something I do hope you'll have a look at that paper because that is one area which I hope that, that I've got something useful to show you, how you can do that. Okay. <laughs> is there anything other that you feel, yes? Uh, the, the, the earlier part of your talk reminded me of, um, I don't know if you might have heard of the Scania, who in the late 70s and early 80s, um, had held lectures in love, on love, at um, one of the US universities, and he kind of had the courage to videotaped and wrote books about it. And it was um, a very important part of my foundation because that was very early in my career that we had motivational speaker who showed some of these videos. And I, I just remember thinking how courageous to be able to talk about something that is, you know, might not be taken seriously. Um, and how can I at some point in the future through my career, because I had this foundation of love through the work that I did, how can I have that courage yeah. to be able to stand up and talk about it? And I think this links in very well, and particularly with technology today, and being able to up, you know, have blogs, to be able to yeah. tweet, to be able to have little sound bites like that. You can actually share that philosophy that, that, that you do. Yeah, it, you know, I think this is possibly one of the most difficult areas to overcome. Right? Now, the way that I overcame this embarrassment um, of putting, for example, all my signatures, love Jack. Right? Now the vice chancellor. I'm sure it finds it quite difficult. Let's because the, the, they're not used to it. Now the reason I insist on doing it is that this is about 2004, and we had a technician who was only 50. Uh, it's called Martin Dobson, and he brought into our department of education every day a humour and something I would say a loving warmth of humanity. And I think he got this because. He knew that his life was limited because he had got a particular blood disease. And his response to it was gen definitely to embrace and have a presence of loving more for humanity. Now, he developed cancer and then he died on a Sunday and I was visiting him on the Friday. And the very last thing he said to me, with wonderful, literally fire in, in his eyes, you know, it was, give my love to the department. Yeah? Now, that's all he said, his, his last words. Now, that has meant that it hasn't been an act of courage anymore. You, you know, I get embarrassed when I write a little, you know, Jack to the Vice-Chancellor, but I've got a little bit of the signature where I explain that the reason I'm doing it is because Martin had such an influence in terms of his loving presence, and yes, it does take an act of courage. You know, my, my wife, when she saw it, said, what are you doing? You know, you, spreading the love around the world. Yes, fine. So I, I do think it's very important, this, that if you do love what you do, uh, to actually have that, uh, and this is so difficult <laughs> in terms of a standard of judgment, you, yet you'll see in the accounts, I'll just show you where you can access them, because this in one way um, is a culmination of um, a lot of the work that I, I've been doing. Um, you, you'll get Robbins there, but it, it's on my website, uh, it's just here and then I'll finish, but it's just that if you go into actionresearch.net, and you go into this living theory section, you'll see that I put here, as I said, there are over 32 of the ones that I've actually um, supervised, with that element of coaching right at the heart of it, with the Hallamus criteria. On the web, they've all given these freely. So it's not so unusual, this, that uh, there's no cost, you can download, you can use them freely. And they've been given as gifts, which I really like. I, you know, people have spent a literally minimum five years, sometimes seven or eight years. These are their narratives, and they're just freely available. So if you go into that living theory section, uh, you'll see that uh, the latest one graduates, uh, Marie Huxtable graduates uh, next week. How do I evolve living educational theory, practicing living boundaries? I like the Mark Potts one. I didn't supervise this. Uh, Mark is at Spa University. I did supervise his master's. And he's got a notion of living citizenship. So it's this right at the heart. He does it with uh, partnerships with South African schools in very difficult areas. And you'll see his passion for living citizenship as a standard of judgment. So that section is where I think you'll get the stories which are coming to you freely. 
using this not as just information, just but as narratives that are going through the ether and they're accessible all over the world. And what I'd love to see over the next 10 years is that move where from five of them in the room, there are many more accounts that we can actually access to show your living that theories of your own practice with values that you know are actually moving you to actually enhance you know, the world as it is, so it does become a better world to be. Are we okay with that? Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to say that you know all the meta studies show that it's not the it's not the um, the theory that you use in coaching. It's not the method. None of it. It's the quality of the relationship that makes the difference. And I mean that that's that's in psychology, but it, it absolutely works in coaching too. So who you are is the most important vehicle. Yeah, I think we'll all know that. But what I'm suggesting is that we need to make that public yeah. in the public knowledge base. That, right. yeah, that right. understanding of your embodied knowledge of relationships and values. And I'm hoping that some of the processes that I point out you know, within my um, account today, and also in terms of the stories that others have made available for you, can help you to make that insight about the nature of your relationships and especially influence over time to make that public and share it. Right. Okay? Well, right. <laughs> we've actually got to finish now. So, many, many thanks indeed and for having me here. Well, on behalf of the Association for Coaching, thank you, Jack, for a fascinating presentation. I guess probably like you, a number of things struck me there. One was the connection between the I and the I and the responsibility that each of us needs to take for our own practice and the self-awareness on which that is based. I was really struck by the, the camera in the room and, and this idea of turning the camera on ourselves and I wonder as coaches how often we really do that. I was really struck by this, this concept of alongsidedness that, uh, that you introduced and the values on which that's based and the implications for our practice in terms of power and equality. And so, um, I guess perhaps the, the legacy of your presentation is if we leave here wanting to, to spread that love. So again, on behalf of the association, please can we show our gratitude. <laughs>